Okay, so uh, we start with the hi hats. And they're looped. And they'll keep going round. Imagine being an alien who lands on Earth and you see all these other species moving around and then you see all these humans who are just standing, looking at each other with these air holes at the front of their face, just emitting sound into each other's faces all the time. It's quite an extraordinary behaviour and we're absolutely compelled to do it. My name is Sophie Scott and I'm a Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience here at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience at UCL. Right, so now I'll bring in some bits of percussion. So he's starting with what we call a fricative sound, which is where you rattle a bit of air under closure in your mouth like shh. And he's doing those quickly so you can get a sort of percussive element to that. We think of humans, oh, you know, with the talking apes, but actually we are spectacular mimics and we are very good at producing a range of different sounds with our articulators. My name's the Pete Box and I do this. And what you tend to find is that across human cultures, more or less, any way that we can make a sound has been incorporated somewhere into something linguistic. So if you are a speaker of Osa, which is a sub-Saharan African language, you'll use ingressive speech sounds, so you actually suck air into your mouth. Like I was actually in South Africa, and I met a guy, and he was like, no one English can say my name. I was like, well, what's your name? And he's like, Nebi Unkolo. So I was like, Nebi Unkolo. Nebi Unkolo. Do you know what I mean? And like... My name is Carol Imageddigan and I'm a cognitive neuroscientist working here at the Department of Psychology at Royal Holloway University. We do all have the rather fantastic ability to pick up sounds around us and imitate them. And this is best done, I imagine, in response to sounds that we hear other humans make because we've got the same basic apparatus, we've got the same articulators. And by that, I mean the larynx, the voice box, the lips. So just in your lips. The jaw. You can get the tongue, the teeth. Snare drums, <laughs> kick drums, <laughs> bass lines. They're all relatively set in a sort of overall configuration. And it's just playing around. But there's a lot of flexibility within that. So you have a tongue, which is like massively dexterous, and you can get hi hats, clicks. All I'm moving there is my tongue, really, but my mouth's the same position. And that gives us a lot of potential, but I suppose we don't really know what the outer limits of what you can do with that system are. We know that there is evidence that in certain contexts you can move the larynx a little bit up and down in the throat. So what beatboxers do is they make sounds at their larynx. <laughs> they also make sounds up by sort of harmonising whistles up in their nose. They make sounds by actually producing buzzy or vibration sounds or other sorts of sounds at the lips. Now, in terms of sort of classical understandings of phonetics, you shouldn't be able to do all that at once. But we found, um, we did a recording with uh, Reaps One, where you could see him starting to make a sound at his larynx. So he's making a sort of buzzy sound. Uh, <laughs> there. And then he seamlessly picked that up at his lips. <laughs> so actually, to our ears, you just heard the buzzy sound carry on. And in fact, he's moved to completely where he's making that sound. So now gone from the larynx up to the lips. And he started making a different sound down at his larynx. And he started to produce sort of harmonic sounds up in his nasal cavity. So in fact, he's, he's starting with one source of sound and then spread that out to three. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to start building up the track to its crescendo. What's really interesting is I really thought that what beatboxing was, was thinking about music you liked and working really hard to try and mimic them. Uh, I'm going to add uh, some kind of synth noises. And in fact, when you talk to beatboxers about it, they say that, no, 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 what I did was I, I just kind of play about with sounds, you're just constantly making sounds and then... Uh, snares. <laughs> Eventually, I'd do something that kind of felt right. I actually respond to what my mouth can do rather than actually hearing 
a particular sound. So when you start playing around with beatboxing, you become very in tune and aware of the, the sort of construct of your mouth and throat. You can teach people to get started if you get them thinking about those simple speech sounds like. So I would start just like. I mean, Reap said to me when he got started, he would just like find himself walking down the streets playing about the sounds just on the way to and from school, just for something to do. And then he realised he was getting quite good at it. And it's interesting that if you look at his brain when he's beatboxing, he shows huge amounts of, of motor, sensory motor activation, much more than um, me when I was tried beatboxing. So, you know, I could have a go at game. But when I do that, I'm using my speech production system because what else have I got? I only know how to speak and, you know, I can try mimicking things, but I'm still using speech production to do that. And Reap looked like he disengaged that. Instead of going, right, I want to do a kick drum, my mouth has to go like this. I want to do a snare drum, my mouth has to go like this. It's like kick drum, snare drum. And that's just purely, you know, muscle memory and just like any instrument. Um, if you'd asked me five years ago, I would have said the difference between speech and other sounds is that speech requires very fine control of your articulators. And other sounds like laughing or going or crying, you're basically doing it with your larynx and subglottal pressure. So you don't need to, you're not making fine movements up here. Now beatboxers have shown me that's simply not true. Why have we got these neat little mouths? We've got short, nimble tongues. We've got little domed palates. That lets us talk in a way that our dogs can't talk. We don't have to have. We haven't got great big tongues. We've never come up with a good reason as to why that that bit happened. We can understand the breeding. We can understand the larynx. It all seems to relate to song. The song's good. Babies like song. We don't. We, that doesn't have to follow. And that might have an entirely different pressure. That might have come about through mimicry being really, really useful to us. Perhaps in a way we don't now understand. Push the way.